How's everybody doing? You doing good? Thank you. Hey, if I have not met you yet, my name's Daryl Holden. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, welcome to worship at Christ Community. Great to be with you guys today. Um, if you are new or newer with us and we have not met you yet, we would love that opportunity. Um, you could help us with that. We'd really appreciate it. Um, if you are in the room, you could shoot the QR code on the seat back in front of you with your phone on your camera, and that'll take you to our action page, which there's a digital connect card on there. Um, or if you're in the room and we're done here, you can just walk out the back, and we have a welcome desk out there, and somebody from our team will meet you at that welcome desk. Um, we'll ask for your contact information, and uh, we'll give you a gift. And what we'll do with your contact information, whether you're in the room or whether you're online, you hit that digital connect button there, um, we are gonna contact you, of course, and really see if there's any way we can pray for you, help you, serve you, questions we could answer for you. That's really, the, that's really the gist of that whole deal, but we'd love the opportunity to meet you and see if we could help you connect here at Christ Community. I'm glad you're here this weekend. We're in the fourth weekend of this series. We've been in for a little bit here. This We call it Free From, Free To. And this is a, this is a, a walk through the ancient New Testament letter that was written to the Galatians, which was written about 48, 49 AD, so within 20 years after Jesus died on the cross, rose again from the dead. And this letter is about spiritual freedom. It's about the freedom that God has given to us. It's about what he has set us free from and what he has set us free to. And so this, this six weeks that we're in in this series is really an exploration of, of the freedom that God is giving to us, how we can receive what he wants us to have and live that out in meaningful ways. What we, what we see each week is we're in this, and what we know from our experience is we live our everyday lives. It's really hard to live free. We struggle to live in the freedom that God wants to give to us. We drift in different ways and find ourselves back in spiritual bondage. And so, and so we're gonna talk today about kind of the weight and the responsibility that you and I have to live in the freedom that God has given to us. So Galatians chapter five, verse one, is really the verse we're gonna launch from in our time together today. After four chapters of talking about freedom and the importance of freedom and what it's like to live in freedom, we get this, we get this exhortation. Like this, is a, this is a great statement. If you've ever been part of a locker room, you've seen a locker room speech, you've seen one on TV after when a team is preparing for a game, like this is, this is the emphasis, like the Apostle Paul who's writing this letter to that ancient church in Galatian region and to you and to me. Like this is, this is a challenge and an exhortation and encouragement all wrapped up. And he says to us, he says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So freedom is the reason that Jesus sets people free. He, he wants you to have and to experience his kind of freedom. Freedom is the reason that he set you free. Now what you have to know, this freedom that he gives to people like you and to me, this freedom, it's a gift. Like we, don't, we get to receive it. We just to say yes to it. He's, it's free to us. But, but it's free to us, it wasn't, it wasn't free to him. This is, this is not a cheap gift that he's offered to people like you and me. This is, this is a gift that cost Jesus everything. Jesus left the splendor and glory of heaven. He is the center of an object of worship in heaven and he laid all of that aside and he came to earth and he lived like one of us. He lived in our midst, he walked a mile in our shoes and he lived a perfect life and then he died on a cross. Like he submitted himself to, to the cruelest and most humbling form of death in the day in which he lived so that he could pay for your sins and my sins. And then he entered into death and conquered death, rose again from the dead, and it's his victory over death that purchases our freedom. So his willingness to, to leave heaven, to come here, to be one of us and be subject to life as a mere mortal and then to die a death that, that is one of our kinds of death so that you and I could be free. Like he, he gives that to us. And, and so this, this free to us, but very costly freedom, it is for freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. 
So don't go back into any kind of spiritual slavery. Live in this spiritual freedom that he gives to you. So what we're gonna do together today, so I want us to kind of, we're gonna kind of survey our way through Galatians just to explore kind of the broader brush what this freedom is, what it's like that, that he is giving to us. And then we're gonna talk about some threats to that freedom. Because, because you and I could drift back into spiritual slavery so easily. So we're gonna talk about some threats to this freedom, and then we're gonna talk about how you and I can stand firm, how does we can stand firm and not be burdened again by a yoke of spiritual slavery, all right? So we're gonna do those three things together, and I think this will be really encouraging and helpful for you. So to start with spiritual freedom, and if you just kinda, we kinda make our way through Galatians, a lot of descriptors, of it, it's about how we get to live. So first, living in the grace of Christ. And we talked about this in the first week together. We talked about how we have been set free from this present evil age and we get to live in grace, and to live in the grace of Christ, to live, to live in his acceptance, forgiveness, wholeness in our relationship with God, the potential for wholeness in our relationships with other people, healing from God, hope for this life, for the life to come. I mean, it just goes on and on and on about what it's like to live in the grace of Christ. And so, so you and I, we are, we are set free from, from ungrace. We're set free from, from the harshness of, of this present evil age. We're set free from the hopelessness of life apart from Jesus. He sets us free and we get to live in his grace. We also get to live with spiritual certainty. There's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of spiritual doubt, there's a lot of spiritual uncertainty, there are a lot of spiritual messages in the world, there's a lot of spiritual messages in the culture in which we live today, and, and many of them are not true. And, and the spiritual message that you embrace, the truth, that you choose to live by, like, you could be living with a lot of doubt and a lot of uncertainty in your life, but when Jesus sets you free, you get to live with spiritual certainty. Hey, one of the things that he wants for you is he wants for you to know and to live in his truth, capital T, truth. Not, not your truth and not somebody else's truth, but in his truth and to live in his way. And one of the beautiful things he's done for people like you and me is he's, we put our trust in Jesus, he's given us his spirit and his spirit talks to us and, and tells us that we're living in truth. And so this freedom, we get to exchange, we get to exchange doubt and uncertainty for, for certainty and assurance in our spiritual lives. And then we get to live with a clear conscience before God and before other people, to live with a clear conscience before God because, because he's forgiven you, because he has looked at you and he has declared you to be right in his eyes, from his perspective, not because of anything that you have done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. And it's this beautiful thing where Jesus is willing to take his rightness, his righteousness, and, and give it to you, and it rests on you as you rest in him, and when God looks at you, he sees you through Jesus and says about people like us, he says about us, that, that you're right, you're, you're forgiven, you're free to go, as we talked about this a few weeks ago, and so, so you can live because you've been forgiven by him, you can live with a clear conscience before God. And when you have a clear conscience before God, that, that translates into a clear conscience with other people. We live in a world where there is, there is so much finger pointing and there is shaming and there is blaming and there is, like, there is so much guilt and condemnation in the culture in which you and I live. And, and when you are when you are clean before God and you know that you are clean before God, 
that doesn't really change the guilt and the shaming and the condemnation that's in our world, but it does, it does help it not stick to us. And so, so when, there, when there are things that are being said to or about you, instead of that settling on, on you and informing your identity and you begin to think that this is who you are, that that's not who you are. You belong to God and he's looked at you and he said over you that you are right you're clean, you're in front of me, like you're free to go, and you get to live from that, from that posture. And so you live with a clean conscience, a clear conscience before God and before others. This freedom, it involves living in line with the truth of the gospel. Living in line with the truth of the gospel. It's just like this gospel, this good news, God's good news about Jesus and his death and his resurrection for us and how that's applied to us. And now as forgiven people, we get to be forgiving people. And as, as people who are filled with hope, we get to be hope givers. As people who have God's life in us, we get to be life givers in the relationships and the circles that we have. Like we, get to, we get to live in line with the truth of the gospel. With this beautiful privilege of being able to represent God to other people and his, his, his love and his acceptance and his willingness towards the people who are in our circles of influence, instead of stepping back and folding our arms and being part of the shame and condemnation crowd, we get to be part of the love and the acceptance crowd. We get to live in line with the truth of the gospel. And when you're living out who God made you to be, it's a beautiful and amazing thing. And so this freedom includes us getting to live in line with the truth of the gospel. And then, it moves on to living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. In, um, this is from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And, and we get to live by faith, not like checking a box that I prayed a prayer. Not like that. But, but God himself, Jesus, the Son of God himself, he loves you. And he has given himself for you. And he... He is making you and remaking you. And so you get to live this life of, of trust, of relational trust, of confidence in him and who he is creating you to be and of the plan that he has for your life and of the willingness that he has towards you to lead you into good places and into good things. And so, so you and I get to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, we don't have to live by our own effort. We don't have to live by the best that we can do. We don't have to live by somebody else's plan or direction for our lives. We get to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us when we've been set free. And then, and then we get to live in the presence and the power of God. Because when Jesus sets you free, he gives you his Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. And, and he, is, he is God in you. We're gonna talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit some next weekend. This is, this is God living inside of you so that he is, he is so close. He's not just your father who is in heaven over and above. He is he is your savior and your God who lives inside of you. He's your God, you belong to him. And you get to live in his presence and you get to live from his power in your life. You don't have to do anything by yourself. Whatever struggles you're facing, whatever difficulties you encounter, whatever's going on in relationships that you have or whatever's happening at work, or whatever, whatever it is in your life, you do not have to do that alone. You're never alone in that. Because when Jesus sets you free, you get to live in the presence of God. And not only is he with you, he'll give you what you need to live through that well. You have, you have the presence of God and the power of God. And if you are facing something right now and you've been, and you've been facing it a little, feeling like you're alone and like you don't have what it takes, God does not have that for you. That is not his desire for your experience in this moment. His desire for your experience is that you would know his presence and that you would know his power in your life. This is the kind of freedom that he's 
giving to us. This is the kind of freedom that he offers to us in Jesus that we would get to live in his presence and in his power. And then we get to live under his blessing and his promise and his favor. I don't know, I don't know what like your experience, your background with church or with faith or who you think God is. A lot of people think God's a taker. That God's a no God and that he's just wanting to look, take stuff from you. That is, and maybe you've had that experience with somebody. Like that is, that is the farthest thing from the truth. Like God is not a taker. He's not a no God towards you. He's a yes God and he's a giver. And so you and I get to live in that experience of God being a giver, a giver of good things. In this freedom that he's giving to us, we get to live under his hand of blessing, where, he's, where he puts his hand on our head and declares things over us to be true, that we belong to him, that, that, we, are, that we are forgiven, that we are right, that, that we have meaning and purpose in our lives. And when when God says that to you and about you, that he blesses you and you get to live in his blessing and he makes promises. He is, he is an up close and personal God. He is up close and personal God and he makes promises to his people. He makes good promises to us. And when he makes a promise, he is always yes. It is always a yes to us. When he promises and when you are walking in the freedom that he wants to give to you, you are under his hand of blessing and you are a recipient of his promises that he, he's just a big yes to you and his favor is on you. God is not looking at you, frowning with his arms crossed, waiting for you to mess up. He is looking at you with joy and with delight. There's a verse in the ancient prophecy of Isaiah that talks about how he rejoices over his people with singing. When God looks at you and you're walking in the freedom that he's given, makes him so happy, he sings over you because you are experiencing this freedom. You get to live under his blessing and you get to live under his promise and you get to live under his favor. And he is a yes God towards you. And then you get to live as his child. Ezra talked about this last weekend, and if you've, if you've missed any of these messages, I think they're worth going back to listen to last weekend talking about our identity, where, where we are, where God says about us that we, we are his children. We're not servants in his house. We're not, we're, we don't have to earn his favor. We don't have to deserve what he's gonna do for us. He's just looked at us and he said, hey, you're, you, you're my child. You belong to me. I'm, I'm your God. You're my family. And when you get to live from that spot as your identity where you can go from there, you just, you are, you are free, you're free to run. You're free to run. And this freedom that God gives to us, to his people, it's this incredible freedom. And it all kind of wraps up with this little verse. It's in the end of Galatians chapter five. And it's talking about the fruit of the spirit, the spirit who lives in you. When you're experiencing this freedom that God wants to give to you, What's happening in your life, the fruit of the Spirit, what's being produced in your life, this is for you, that you would be living in God's kind of love and his kind of joy and his peace, his forbearance, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, self-control. Like this, is, this is what freedom looks like. When you're experiencing freedom, this is what it looks like for you and because every gift God gives his people, it is so for us, it's for us to experience and to live in and to enjoy, but it's also for the people who are around us. You get to, you get to live out God's kind of freedom in your circles of influence. And so you get to be God's love and God's joy and God's peace in, in your circles of, of influence and impact. And so when we're walking in this freedom, like we've been granted freedom, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so, so when we see what this freedom is, it begins to make a lot of sense as to why the Apostle Paul, as he's writing, why God wants his people to experience this freedom. Like I'm giving you this beautiful gift. Don't go back. Don't, don't let yourself be enslaved 
by anyone or anything else. I've set you free, and because I've set you free, you are free, and you live, and you walk in that freedom. And so God has given us this beautiful freedom in our lives, and this is the kind of stuff, this is the stuff you want for yourself. I, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you'd set goals for yourself or you have dreams about what your near or distant future look like, but this is, this is what you want your future to be. You wanna be free. You wanna walk and live in the freedom that God gives to his people through Jesus. This is what the people who love you want for you. This is, this is what the people who love you most want for you to experience. This is what God wants you to have. If you're, if you're wondering what kind of God he is and what he thinks about you and what he, what he wants for you today and for your future, this is it, this freedom that he wants you to have because you are in relationship with him through his son Jesus. Like this, this is what it is. This is who God is and this is what he has for you. And so you and I get this great privilege of being able to experience and walk in this freedom. And then we read in this verse that we started with today, such strong pleading, such strong pleading is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't you go back. Don't you go back. Don't you let, don't you let someone or something else make you a spiritual slave again. And you know what that tells us? That tells us that we have a choice in this. Don't you go back, he says. You, you, have, you have the right and the opportunity to, to stand where you are, you also have the ability to walk away back into what you were before. And he says, the spirit of God through the apostle Paul says to people like you and me, you have this beautiful freedom, do not go back into it. And so let me talk to you about three threats to our freedom. This is, because it's a warning, don't walk back into spiritual slavery. So so here's, here are the greatest threats, the three greatest threats to spiritual freedom. The first one is just refusing the freedom that Jesus gives us. If he's offering you freedom and you're refusing to take it, it's a gift that he wants to give to you and maybe, maybe like your posture towards him has been, no thanks, like I'm good for right now. I've, I've got this on my own. And you can chase that out. Like you, could, you can live that way and you're gonna come to the same end that so many of us who used to live that way did. You're not, it's not good, like it's not good. There's, there's no life, there's no light, there's no future, there's no hope down that path, but until you, until you come to that spot, but if, if you're refusing the freedom that Jesus offers you because you think you're good, like there's danger in that. And, or you could, you could be like, hey, I'm doing this myself. I'm gonna do this myself, like I am all for Jesus, and like I'm, I'm gonna do this myself, I'm, I'm gonna, like I'm gonna earn this, I'm gonna deserve this. Boy, that's, that's a treadmill to nowhere too, of if you're trying to earn it, if you're trying to deserve it, if you think somehow I'm gonna be good enough, or I'm gonna, like I'm gonna figure out exactly what God wants, and then I'm gonna go do that part, like there's, you're refusing, you're refusing this gift that, that Jesus is offering you, this freedom that he's offering to you. And so just so refusing that freedom is, that's, that's the first threat to having it is to say a no to it for whatever reason you might be saying no to it. The second one is being religious instead of participating in a relationship with Jesus. If you're religious, so you're a church person, you got your you got your list of things that you do and don't do because that's what good Christian people do or don't do and you live by checking the boxes because you or somebody else decided that these are the boxes that I'm gonna check to be a good Christian person. If you're, if you're just religious, if you're religious and you're not participating in a relationship with Jesus, that, that is a threat to your spiritual freedom because because religion becomes your master. Religion becomes your master. That list of rules that, that you or somebody else has given to you, whether it's set or whether it's moving target for you, that list of rules, that's what's in control. That's what's over you. And, and so as you look at religion, that could become like you're not, if you're a religious person, you, you, are, you are likely not living in the freedom that 
that God gives to people through Jesus. It's really interesting to me, as the Apostle Paul writes these words, that ancient church at Galatia, he says to him, he says, hey, don't go back again. Like, don't let anybody make you subject again to a spiritual yoke of slavery, right? Again, what these people were before Paul came and introduced them to Jesus, what they were is that they were, they were pagan idolaters. They would have had little idols in their home and the temples where they went and worshiped. And they, like, people, people like you and me would have looked at that group. They, were, they had little idols. They lived in this. And, and what he writes to them is, hey, you were in, you were in spiritual slavery before because you were part of a religion where you lived in fear and you had to do certain things and that like there was to keep your gods happy and whatever all it was, you, you could go back to that as, as a person who is now religious as a Christian person. You're just exchanging one form of spiritual slavery for another. So it's in the name of religion, in the name of religion, you can exchange one form of spiritual slavery for another. And so if you, are, if you are practicing a religion, but you are not participating in a relationship with Jesus, like that is, you, you can't walk in freedom and practice a religion. It's a huge threat to your spiritual freedom. And then this third one is ignoring your relationship with Jesus and living like the old you wants to live. Just ignoring that relationship with Jesus and living like the old you, who you were before you met Jesus, that person. Because the Bible talks about, the Bible talks about how in Jesus we are a new creation. He makes us new, we get to be made new. And he gives us a new heart. And he fills us with his life and his light and his love. Like we're, we are new people. But you can live like the old you, and the Apostle Paul in the letters that he writes in the New Testament, he often calls that old who you used to be before you met Jesus, he refers to that as the flesh. And I think it's super gross, to the, just like your flesh. <laughs> and he, he says, like, that old you is just way, and if you, are, if you are living, if you are ignoring your relationship with Jesus and living like the old you wants to live, the old you will lead you back into bondage. Now, the whole way there, it will tell you, finally, you're free. Finally, you're free. You've been doing that church thing or you've been doing that Jesus thing and let's get away from that and finally, you're free and, and, and it will lead you back toward what looks in the moment, in the moment and, and feels like freedom, but it is, it is quickly bondage for people like you and me. This idea that like, hey, I could just go do whatever I wanna do, like, that, is, that is bondage. So I like to read some about, about the um, opening up of the west of our country, and there are stories about pioneers who are traveling across the Great Plains. And, and they are, like, this, the freedom that they experience as they're traveling across the Great Plains it's, it's just wide open space and there are no boundaries and there are never any boundaries in that great, great plains of the United States. And there are stories of pioneers who went insane because for days on end, there's, there's no boundary. It's just, it's just wide open space in front of us. And, and that's the kind of place the old you, the flesh, will lead you to. It's, you're, you're not free in a wide open space. You are, you are bound by the lack of boundaries and trying to live to the ends of who you thought you were, who you used to be. And so if you're, if you're, if you're shrugging off and ignoring your relationship with Jesus and living like the old you wants to live, like that, is, that is a huge threat to your spiritual freedom. It's leading you into bondage and, and so as we're talking through these things, another thing that has just jumped out at me as we spent these weeks in Galatians is that there are really only two options. There are really only two options. You can live in freedom or you can live in bondage. 
You can experience the freedom that only Jesus gives or you're living in bondage. If you're not receiving the freedom that comes to you through Jesus, then you're living in some sort of spiritual slavery. And so for people like you and me, it, it bears asking like, okay, so how do I experience this freedom? How do I stand firm in it? Because if you're not experiencing freedom, here's what you're experiencing. You are now on the enemy of your soul's agenda for your life. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you're not living in the freedom that God is offering to you through Jesus, you are living on the agenda of the enemy of your soul, and he is walking you down the path to steal, kill, and destroy. And so how is it that I stand firm in this freedom? Right? How, how do people like you and me who are receiving this freedom, how do, how do we stay in freedom and not drift back or walk away into bondage? And so I, there's one answer to this, and I'm gonna give you a few pieces to it. You and I stay, the way we stay in freedom, we stand firm in freedom, is by nurturing our relationship with Jesus. That's, that is the one way to live free and to continue to live free is to nurture your relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm gonna give you some things to do. Here's the danger for me standing on a stage and giving you things to do to nurture your relationship with Jesus. You might hear me giving you some boxes to check. So, Okay, so Pastor Darrell said, if I do these four things, check, 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 now I'm getting to live in this freedom. No, that is not what I am talking about. <laughs> that is... That is that is not it. If you, if you turn these things into a checklist, and if I do these four things, check, 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 God's gonna be happy with me and I'll be good. No, this is, this is relational work. This is relational work. One of the things that Marie and I do, we have a date night every week. If we approach that date night, like I just get, okay, we had a, we had a date, so now we have a good marriage. No, like that's, it's relationship, it's nurturing relationship and there are things you do to nurture a relationship and so I'm offering you these things not as boxes to check so that somehow God will be pleased with you, not as, not as boxes to check so that now you'll be a good Christian. I'm telling you the way to freedom is to nurture your relationship with Jesus and Christian people over the centuries and around the globe have found these kinds of things to nurture their relationship with Jesus. And so start with, with reading your Bible and being a person who prays. And really interesting research done back in 2009, quoted this to you a number of times, the, the impact of, of being a person who reads their Bible and prays four times a week or more, the, the fruit that that bears in your life is exponentially greater than, than somebody who does it three times a week or less. Makes sense, right? It's a relationship. If you're, if you're spending almost no time with someone else, of course that relationship is gonna suffer. But if you are prioritizing a relationship and you are engaging with that relationship on a regular basis, that relationship is gonna begin to flourish. And one of the primary ways that you and I nurture our relationship with Jesus is, is through his word and through prayer, talking with our Heavenly Father. And so we have these, these beautiful opportunities, these privileges that he has given to us, this invitation that he offers to people like you and me to nurture our relationship with him. So it's the Bible and prayer four times a week. Regularly connecting with other Christian people you are not alone. You're not alone because the Spirit of God lives inside of you and you're not alone because we're here. We, we come to church to be at church regularly and not to give this up and not to treat it like it's, like it's an option. This is, if you wanna walk in freedom, being at church is, is of highest importance because what we do for, like what God does for us when we meet together, when, when he, where two or more of us are gathered in his name, he says he's in our midst. So we experience his presence when we're together in ways that we do not experience when we're alone. 
And so being here and being together with other Christian people, and it's, and it's this gathering where we, we spur one another on. Hebrews 10 talks about we spur one another on to love and to good deeds. And so to be at church so you can have life breathed into you by other people who believe what you're believing, who are facing the same kind of stuff outside this room, but, but inside this room we remind each other like, hey, we're not alone. We're in it, like the Lord is in it with us and we're in it together and these things we believe, they're first importance in our life. Like, let's go. And so, and so we, church, and then to have a small group, a smaller group of people who know Jesus and who know you, who love Jesus, who love you, who are, who are for him and for his mission and who are for you. And these, these are the rooms where, like, this is where we experience life together, where we share our lives with one another and we, and we head into life together, being there for and with each other, other people in your lives, other Christian people in your lives who know what's happening, and you know what's happening in them, and we pray for each other, and we encourage each other, we're in touch with each other. This is, if you're gonna experience the freedom that God has for you to be part of a group like that, like that that's, that's a critical thing to, to make and to pour into your Christian friendships. Regularly connect with other Christian people, and then to serve other people in Jesus' name. To serve in Jesus' name, when you serve in Jesus' name, you find him. <laughs> when, you, when you move towards people in Jesus' name, you actually find him. Like you go with him and you find him in that. And you get, to, you get to know and experience him in unique ways when you're serving other people the way he served us. I was thinking about this point in particular and thinking about something that Jesus said, that he said to his followers about um, about how we love people. And he told his followers, he said, hey, okay, so you love the people who love you. Hey, everybody does that. But loving your enemies, that's when you know you're loving like I love and you're loving with my kind of love. Love your enemies, he says. So, so I, I think I think we can drop that into this idea of serving because loving is one of the ways or serving is one of the ways that we express his kind of love, to serve other people in Jesus' name, not just, not, not just what's comfortable and convenient and easy in me and mine, because everybody does that, right? But you know you're serving in Jesus' name, you're serving other people in Jesus' name when it costs you, and there's sacrifice involved. And so to serve in Jesus' name, because, because he's with us as we're laying things down for him and as we're walking into service opportunities that are difficult, scary, like we don't really know what's, we, he's with us in that and we find him in those things that nurtures this relationship with him. And then that last one is there just, is being a yes person, saying yes to your next steps. We talk about we're a next steps church really because that's, that's part of following Jesus. He doesn't stand still. You don't, you don't walk to Jesus and then you're there. He's, he's always moving forward and we get to move forward with him and saying yes to the next steps that he has for you. If, if you stop, if you walk to him and then you stop and you just, uh, I'm, I have come this far and I shall go no further. You know, if that's, if that's your posture, I've taken enough steps. If that's your posture, like Jesus continues to move and he's, he's with you, but he's, you're not gonna know him. You're not gonna know him because he's, he's moving into places and into people's lives and into opportunity and into impact and, and into things that he's got for you, days he's got for you ahead. If you're just, if you're just no to him, he, you're, you're standing still and he's moving forward and that you're creating distance in your relationship with him. And so to be a yes person, to be, to be a person who says yes to the next steps that he has for you, so, to spend time in the Bible, not checking boxes, not checking boxes. If you're thinking, okay, if you made a little list and you put little boxes by it so you can check them off this week, that is danger. That is, that is a threat to your spiritual freedom. But if, but if you, okay, Jesus, I wanna be free and I wanna know you. And I want you to know me and I wanna know you. So I'm gonna spend time with you. I'm gonna pay attention to our relationship through your word and in prayer, and I'm gonna be with Christian people because as we know each other, we get to know you, and I am going to serve other people because if I serve sacrificially, you're in that. 
And I'm a yes person, I'm just, I'm a yes person. What you have for me, what's next? Like, that's, that's the kind of person I'm gonna be. If, if, if we're these kind of people who are pursuing this relationship that we've been offered with Jesus, you know what our life is like? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, freedom, freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm in that freedom. Don't let anyone or anything push you back into spiritual slavery again. Can I pray this over you? Would you guys bow your head and close your eyes with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for setting us free. If you hadn't moved towards us, we are sunk. We're trapped, we're enslaved. And in and through Jesus, you have, you have redeemed us, you have rescued us from our bondage, and you have, you have set us in wide open spaces. And so I'm praying for myself and I'm praying for my friends who are part of this worship service today that, that we would walk and live in the freedom that you are giving to us. And Jesus, all of this, all of this comes to us through you, and we are really grateful. We're saying yes to it, and so we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you guys for being here, being part of this worship service. Um, before you head out, like, if you need somebody to pray with you or pray for you about anything that's going on in your life, maybe it's something we talked about today, maybe it's something totally unrelated, but you've been, you've been weighing it, you've, you've been wearing it as you've been in this room, if you've been online. If you're in the room, come forward to our prayer team. They'll be down here. If you're online, click the prayer button. We would love to pray with you about these things that are happening in your life. So again, thanks for being part of this. Um, I love you guys. I hope you have a great weekend. Look forward to seeing you next week. You're dismissed.